Halsey's has recently been in the market for a new country. He's been searching across different continents in the Middle East and South America looking for really heavily jungle areas where he can move his country and all the people in it there. Because in two years, if something doesn't change, his islands will be underwater. That is why we strongly stand in support of the motion that this house would, this house would mandate recycling programs in developing countries. Our model is that the UN will have an international mandate that developing countries must allocate more resources towards environmental protection and awareness by one, putting more trash cans and recycling bins in public places, and two, creating infrastructure and capabilities to sort through trash and process recycled goods. These programs will be similar to the ones that already exist in the developed world. In addition, UN, the NGOs that will operate with the UN and other ones that, would, that might be created by the UN in the future will cooperate with the developing countries to produce these, to produce these for sake of plans. We will present three points to you in today's debate. First, that this will be good for the environment. The second is that this will be good for the developing world. And the third is that this will foster constructive engagement within the international arena. That third point we brought up to you our second speaker. Now, on to our first point that this will be good for the environment. Bottles and cans and paper and other recyclable materials will be sent to recycling pans and sorted and processed and then used to create new products. Or they will be sold back to companies who buy back recycled goods. The most notable of these is Coca-Cola. They will buy back old cans or bottles for five to 10 cents per area and then use those rather than producing new materials because it's economically viable for them. In so, this has lots of beneficial environmental impacts. The first is that there will be less plastic waste, because they, are, they aren't just being thrown away, but being reused. There are a lot of problems with plastic waste. The first, really big one, is that it gets in the way of infrastructure. Yes? Okay, we tell you that your fundamental premise in your model won't work. If you're going to use the United Nations, you're also asking China. We say that China will veto this action because we've seen that China, in terms of in environmental progressivism, it doesn't agree with like Western ideologies. Right, so there are a few issues with that. The first is that the debate is not about will this happen, it's would we do it if we could. Would and will are fundamentally different questions. The second is that this isn't a predictive debate. It's what would be better if we were to do it. Then, also, the UN wouldn't do this because, as my second speaker will talk more about, but I'm happy to talk about it now, this is an environmental issue that affects everyone. Overfishing in China has been huge. Different issues with the ecosystem where they haven't been able to produce enough food have been huge. Problems with litter and recycling have been big for China. Also, China is trying to increase their hegemony and their, pop and their, like, and their uh, positive influence in the developing world. If China doesn't have, if China doesn't participate, if China vetoes it, they won't be able to increase that hegemony or increase that influence, and they'll be seen as a negative presence. So China will actually participate. Yeah. In addition, uh, non-recycled plastic material gets in the way of infrastructure. India is a really good example of this. They're having trouble running public transportation because there's trash filling the streets. They can't build new buildings, public or private. They can't develop because there's just so much plastic waste. Simple recycling plants would be an easy way to deal with this. In addition, the plastic waste, in addition, cars and buses can't get by so people can't get to work. In addition, plastic waste gets into the ocean and kills animals. You see fish or other marine creatures choking on plastic waste. This might seem like a trivial problem, but there are two huge issues that arise from this. The first is a basic animal rights problem. There is no reason why we can't, why it would be better for us to kill all of these innocent animals who haven't done anything to us just so that we can have whatever issues the opposition talks about. We need to protect those lives. It's not up to us to kill them. But the second really big issue is that it destroys ecosystems, which has effects on animals and on us, bigger than we realize. If a tuna or a fish chokes on a plastic bag, that not only destroys that tuna and that population, it destroys these sharks or whatever animals would be eating that all the way up the food chain. But then, the also not so noticeable impact people don't think about is it destroys down the food chain. Whatever the tuna was supposed to eat, whatever that animal was supposed to eat, the algae, the plankton, the fungi, those can, those can populate and reproduce at massive rates if they aren't being stopped exponentially that will then disrupt an ecosystem to the point where it can't function anymore. This has huge impacts for humans because they won't be able to grade, gain food or eat. And these fungi play a huge part in taking carbon dioxide or other materials out of the atmosphere. This is an exponential impact and it just keeps going. We cannot know how bad it will be if we don't stop this cycle. In addition, this will cause less plastic manufacturing. There are a lot of problems with plastic manufacturing. It is up there with cars in terms of one of the biggest global pollutants. 
We need an international effort to stop this. In China, athletes struggled to perform their tasks adequately because the air quality was so bad because of plastic manufacturing. What I just said in my intro about the Maldives sinking, the ocean level is rising. Global warming is an internationally accepted problem. But then, we also, this is also a problem, this is not only a problem because the environment is crucial and it's where we come from, and it is not okay for humans to destroy that or treat it as if it is a trivial impact, but it is also critical because the reason why we have all these topics about trying to get to space or trying to colonize the moon is because we're worried that soon, very soon, our world will be unlivable. That there are problems every year arising from global warming, from icebergs melting, from flooding, from animals in the Arctic dying. We need to think more about how we can actually solve these problems. The only way to actually engage multinational companies, pay attention to the environment, is to have an international consensus. Multinational corporations will go into the developing world, and because there is no one there with force telling them, you can't treat this country, you can't treat this environment badly, we need an international consensus to force them to stop. Now on to my second point, that it's good for the developing world. This creates jobs. Trash and recycling collectors, people building and operating recycling plants, people running and working in the recycling plants, people running these programs, people running the bureaucracy that develops it, people cleaning the streets, people engaging in buyback for the multinational corporations. This is a huge network of new jobs. In addition, this will help clean up the streets for other companies. This is good for the tourist industry, because one of the reasons that India's tourist industry isn't growing bigger is because people are worried about the streets being clean. This is true throughout the developing world and developing countries. In addition, it's also important for all the reasons I stated earlier, for having buildings, for having buses, for having public transportation, for being able to process people around cities or countries. In addition, it'll improve infrastructure. It'll be an improvement in technology. They need transportation to run through this. They need transportation to run through this. You need transportation to get things from, from bins to plants. You need transportation for lots of different purposes, and this infrastructure is critical. This is much better than blanket aid. Our solution to help the developing world with other countries, aside from the environment, is always to give them money, to give them things. But for a lot of reasons, this is better. The biggest reason of this is that it's specific. It is investment in specific places. It prevents leaders from coming in and taking the money and using it for their own purposes. It determines here is something that is an international consensus. Another huge problem with aid is that it comes off as the developing world, as the developed world, telling the developing world, here is what you should do, or here is us being benevolent to you. But this is because the developed world needs this. Every single country has an investment in making sure that we protect our environment, that we stop the rapid deterioration of the environment, because this affects everyone, the entire human race. And so because of that, all the other countries will feel invested. They will donate resources, and they need to donate resources. And this international consensus is a huge necessary step in protecting the environment. And that is why we are proud to stand and propose the motion. Thank you. the finals. So this is actually Simon then. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Uh, what was the time? Uh, we thank the lady for her speech and we're happy to um, call off the first speaker of team opposition. Ladies and gentlemen, the biggest problem that we have with the side proposition is that everything that they propose to us is impractical in today's world, ladies and gentlemen. They tell us that it's not about whether or not it can happen. I will tell you that, ladies and gentlemen, it is, it, it is about that, ladies and gentlemen. Because, first of all, if it cannot happen, we cannot argue, uh, we cannot argue the morals of the side, ladies and gentlemen. We cannot argue anything about the debate if something cannot happen in today's debate. And therefore, I want to show you why their policy does not stand, why their policy is impractical and will never work specifically for the developing countries. Ladies and gentlemen, the first problem with the policy. The first problem, ladies and gentlemen, that they have not shown a consequence, right, 
of not being able to mandate this right. So first of all, they haven't incentivized the developing countries, ladies and gentlemen, of doing anything. If you don't do this, ladies and gentlemen, what are we going to do if you don't do this? And we see that right now in terms of uh, third world countries, we see African countries that have a, a negative perception in the international community, ladies and gentlemen, right? We see Mugabe not wanting anything to do with Britain because he feels like, you you colonize me, sit down, I'm not going to take your orders. I don't like you. The same thing, ladies and gentlemen, with, with China. They don't want Western influence. They don't want anything to do with the international community, ladies and gentlemen. They want to progress with themselves. We're going to show you how societies in third world countries have been progressing internally and how that's working, ladies and gentlemen. Right. Let me first ca carry on with one of the, with, with their points. First of all, it's good for the environment. Second is that it's, it's good for the developing world. Well, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tackle this by one question. Does their model reach their desired effect? And if it does not reach their desired effect, it won't be good for the environment because the policy won't happen anyways. And it won't be good for the developing world because the policy won't happen anyways, ladies and gentlemen. So, in the African context, we already told you that, okay, African perceptions and so forth, it won't work because, um, uh, because the third world countries don't actually want anything to do with the international community. So, uh, but, Furthermore, we see that in the current economic situation, ladies and gentlemen, we can't expect African countries to go or build an infrastructure in terms of this, ladies and gentlemen. It is unfair to impose this burden on African country, uh, on federal countries, saying, okay, they, what you have to do is go on and, uh, and build these things, and we expect them to have money, ladies and gentlemen. That's not the case, and that's where our proposition actually failed in today's debate. So because I've showed you that their policies actually won't work based on two things, economics and politics, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the, the, their, po their points should fall flat. I want to furthermore actually analyze this, th this point by the nature of developing countries and show you how, how this won't work, ladies and gentlemen. Furthermore, our second speaker, Kaisen Ghalibedi, will actually analyze moral hazard in today's debate. Yes, ma'am. You aren't realizing that African countries are actually currently accepting aid from the, United, from the United Nations and from NGOs to help clean up the trash diary, which means that they are accepting aid to help the, the economy and the environment. Well, you argue that it's cool then. What's the point of the debate, ladies and gentlemen? What you're saying right now is that we're going to mandate them to do this, but you already have this into, into the state of school, ladies and gentlemen. The proposition team is actually failing to show us where the policy is going to be applied. If the policy is being applied anyways, if they're giving them aid anyways, we don't have to mandate them, ladies and gentlemen. So the proposition should actually come with a policy that doesn't exist and implemented in today's society, ladies and gentlemen. Right. So furthermore, I want to analyze the nature of developing countries, ladies and gentlemen, and show you why this won't work and how this won't work. And yes, this debate is about whether or not it will work or not. Because if it won't work, then the desired effect, the proposition we want to achieve, won't be able to come about. Sit down. So I want to analyze in the same way I analyze my rebuttals, but further and deeper, ladies and gentlemen. Right? The economic barriers that we have and the political barriers that we have in terms of reaching the desired effect. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the economic barriers. First of all, what we have right now in the economic situation, ladies and gentlemen, is that we have countries all around the world being in recession and being in tough times in terms of money, ladies and gentlemen, right? So what happens further on is that these countries, like Somalia, these countries, ladies and gentlemen, in Africa, don't really have enough resources to actually hand, hand out. Why is this? They have priority, or they have priority, ladies and gentlemen, of actually handling the affairs of their country in terms of feeding the people, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, right? Of actually creating uh, some sort of uh, uh, some sort of. Uh, um, uh, benefit for the people in terms of society, in gentlemen, right? And the proposition haven't proven to us why recycling actually has to be a priority in, in third world countries. Because third world countries, the gentlemen, are actually in dire need and they have to prioritize what is important to them. The proposition side haven't shown us why recycling in, in today's debate is actually important for third world countries, in gentlemen. What we tell you furthermore is that they won't be able to do it and the proposition's case actually falls flat because it is impractical, ladies and gentlemen, right? So that's the economic barrier that we have in today's society. Furthermore, what is the political, bar political barriers that we have in society? 
Furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, we've seen the politics of African country, of third world countries, especially in Africa, are unstable, ladies and gentlemen. So what do we have? We have an administration that does fail, ladies and gentlemen. Let's look, like, let's look at Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe doesn't have a good administration. The Ghana doesn't have a good administration. Most countries, third world countries, are poor because they don't have good administration. So what will happen? These policies and these uh, and this recycling programs won't be able to, uh, to function because the administration in those countries are intrinsic of failure, ladies and gentlemen. Furthermore, we've seen that these countries politically are unstable in terms of striking, in terms of wars, ladies and gentlemen, right? We won't be able to do this if we, have, if we are in, in this type of social dire, ladies and gentlemen. So the proposition has to prove to us how this will work in today's debate, ladies and gentlemen. Furthermore, we told you about China, we told you about African perception at ladies and gentlemen against international community. We told you that China, ladies and gentlemen, will actually veto against this if it is in the United Nations, ladies and gentlemen. Why do we say this? Because we see that China won't want to be forced to do something that they don't want to do, ladies and gentlemen, right? Furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, we don't think that African countries too will be able would be forced to do what they want to do, or what they don't want to do in today's debate, right? And let's analyze status quo in today's debate, right, ladies and gentlemen. We have NGOs in those countries, in African countries, that actually do these certain recycling programs, ladies and gentlemen. They talked about COPE, they talk, and there are many other recycling programs that actually do work in these uh, in these countries. And, what, and how are they doing, ladies and gentlemen? They're actually progressing, and they're actually doing enough work, ladies and gentlemen, to recycle this. And we don't want to impose a burden on, on the governments to actually prioritize the money they could use for feeding their people, ladies and gentlemen, to using it by using it in recycling, ladies and gentlemen. Furthermore, we believe that it won't work on two different levels, economically and because of political barriers. Secondly, thirdly, we showed you that so that so uh, that status quo it is actually working and it is ha ha happening, ladies and gentlemen. UN is already aiding um, African countries and NGOs are running recycling programs, ladies and gentlemen. This debate is about whether or not it can happen, and because it can't happen, the desired effect of the propositions team cannot happen. With that said, thank you. We thank the gentleman for his speech and we'd like to call up the second speaker of Team Proposition. Large. 
where these developing countries are going to get the resources in terms of sure, capacity? Sure, sure. We have two arguments. Them. The first comes from our model. that We say that non-government organizations that are affiliated with the UN will help out in countries that need them most. When, UN has, when the UN has mandated other things and had other projects, they offer aid and they offer money to people who can't do it themselves. The second argument we have is that this is the best money that we can spend because it's an investment. The money goes straight to the people, straight back into the people who need it most. So even though they say, where are we going to get all this money? This money is going towards what we need it to go towards anyways. So there's two responses to that. So now let's look at their second argument that they bring up. It talks about politics, how administrations are unstable. They talk about these vague things that we may not be able to do it. There's a couple problems with this too. The first is that they say, Recycling works, we already have it. How can, but they also say, how can we possibly do this? Well, if recycling works in the status quo, if there are programs that exist, if there are people in developing countries that are doing this, then how can they possibly say that it won't work? This is a big contradiction. So either it does work, and it's okay, and we can institute more, or, oh, sorry, yes? Okay, we tell you that under status quo, it only works with politically and economically stable countries. You're forcing those that No, thank you. They it. said in their last speech that recycling programs work and we don't need to do anything. There's no reason to mandate this if it's already working in the status quo. That's okay. a direct quote from their first speaker. If things are already working, then they don't have to change. If they meet the mandate, if there are already recycling programs, we're not calling for anything additional. We're just saying that everyone should be up to this minimum level. And if it works already, then there's no reason we can't make more and have it work again. A second argument to that is that even unsteady governments know that this is important, which will be brought up in my third speech, because the environment is the biggest threat that we have. Even if you have other priorities in a dictatorship, if you have other priorities in an unsteady democracy, the environment is something that always must be addressed, because it's the most fundamental risk that we have, because it is the only thing that risks the extinction of our entire race. If we don't have a functioning environment, then we don't have a functioning society. And the third argument is that even if there's an unsteady situation, we have multinational corporations and non-government organizations that are affiliated with the UN, that are, that are committed to these missions that can help in those countries. So now let's re-extend the two arguments that my team may brought up. The first is that it's good for the environment. Side opposition never talks about the fact that recycling is bad or that the environment is not a big risk. So in this debate, those are two of the most important impacts that we can link to. We talk about how recycling will bring sorting and reusability to plastic. We won't waste resources anymore, but we'll have second uses for them and we'll make much more use of the resources that we have left. And we also talk about how it can get in the way of infrastructure. They don't respond to this. We talk about India, how there is so much plastic that we can't build new buildings, that we can't have the types of trains and transportation that we need to have a functioning economy. We also talk about how this can get into the ocean, how it kills animals. We talk about animal rights, how there's no reason that we should be doing this and inflicting an unjust harm on them. But we also talk about this has implications for human life and destroying ecosystems. We destroy our food source and we destroy the bacteria that maintains our food source. Side opposition has nothing to say about this. They never say that the environment is not at risk and they never say that we are not stopping and improving environmental reform. Now the second argument talks about how it is good for developing countries. They never respond directly to how this would help, they just say we should give money directly. But as we've given you analysis as to how creating jobs is better, how long-term sustainability is better than a blanket check, we still believe that the second argument is valid. We also talk about specific investments. That when we have a specific investment in a specific area, it is better than having a blanket sum of money. Because in unsteady governments, where places are bound to sometimes have issues, it is better to say we are implementing a specific program than give an unsteady government tons of money to do what they wish and allocate it to the people. In situations where they say they don't trust them to implement an environmental reform, then why would they trust them with large sums of money to help the people anyways? So the only way we're going to help developing countries is with specificity. So now let's go to the third Please. argument. No, thank you. Which is that it fosters constructive engagement. In a world that has become increasingly divided, with so many different tensions, conflicts, and problems, true alliances are harder to come by and harder to maintain. Collaborating in the environment is one of the few areas where we can overcome all of these tensions and work together as a whole. Because when it comes down to it, there are very few non-threatening issues in the global arena, such as economics, politics, sports, all of these different things, such and technology too, they all create unnecessary conflict. Nations try to outdo each other, they try to be the best, they try to prove that they have the best military or the best FIFA team or the best economy. But when it comes to the environment, we're all united. 
because environmental problems ground us back to our vulnerability. Because the differences between us are not important when we realize that we, as a human race, are fundamentally vulnerable to losing forces. There are forces that are greater than us in our petty conflicts, and they are deteriorating at such a quick and scary rate. We all realize that we are fundamentally small in comparison to the forces that help us sustain life. And without a functioning environment, we cannot sustain this. So our whole society will be destroyed, and it makes us collaborate. There are several examples in the past when environmental issues have forced the nation to collaborate in the world. The first is the trash gyre, which are places in the ocean that have accumulated massive amounts of trash, larger than some small states in some cases. The trash destroys the marine life, it harms fishing, it harms the economies of the islands around them. The international community has responded quickly and effectively to these issues. Nations send money to nonprofits to help. The UN has allocated efforts to help, committees, experts, and much more. Another example follows oil spills, such as the BP oil spill, where there was a fast international response to clean up the ocean. People realized immediately how big of a risk leaving oil in the ocean was and responded correctly. They realized that this would destroy the animal life, destroy the food life, and people realized that our environment is taken for granted. They realized this was a huge mistake. Multinational companies and corporations even rallied, defending wildlife, cleaning ducks and sending them back in, such as downy. And because it was at this moment that we had fear, a fear and realization that we need to come together to fight these types of most pressing issues. Only when we have issues that are non-threatening can we get this constructive engagement. And so the environment provides us a unique place for constructive engagement and international cooperation. It's a way that we can help overall just benefit the issues and help the economies of the world, which is why we urge you to do Thank the lady for her speech, and we'd like to call up the second speaker of team opposition. So fine, they tell you that the UN will ask all these countries to please stop this. We tell you first, that status quo. The UN already asks countries to please stop this, so they don't actively change status quo, nor do they make it mandatory, right? We ask them, what is the consequence when I don't apply to this, right? They don't give you a consequence, which means their policy is quite flawed in its own. They don't have a policy at all, because A, they don't have how, because no mechanism is actually implemented. The mechanism that is implemented is implemented under our model, right? Status quo, and we've already advocated for status quo, because it's the best way to do it, right? But beyond that, we would say that even if they were right in saying that the United Nations will do this, we'll tell you perception in most countries won't, won't even change. They won't even accept such aid from the United Nations or from everybody, right? We ask you a question, is what happens when they choose not to? They need to give us con consequences to these countries in order for us to see that this mandatory benefits, m mandatory uh, policy will work, which means that their, uh, which means that their policy, polit uh, policy uh, benef benefits are there, right? We think there's no causation, no logical progression within their argument. They jump from saying that their policy will be implemented like this, but no logical progression to saying how the benefits will be derived. And I've shown you now in my rebuttal speech that the benefits aren't derived from their model because their model is quite ineffective. But even if their model was effective, we would say that you have all these benefits under status quo anyway, so there's no harm in that, right? But we, beyond that, they say that oh, their burden is not to prove that this thing can happen. We would say in a policy debate, will you give us a policy? We would like to know how these things will happen, right, Madam Speaker and uh, Mr. Speaker? We would like to know how these benefits will occur and what is the pragmatic practical like uh, percentage of your policy working. They failed to give us all this. And they ran to say that, no, this won't happen, and we don't need to give 
give this a burden. We would say they're taking the fun out of this debate by not engaging with our matter, right, Mr. Speaker. We would say well, on that regard, their entire policy is quite useless because it does not have a specific burden, right, Mr. Speaker. But beyond that, we would say that even it, uh, our, they're arguing our models, right, by saying that the UN will use this. That's why we were very co uh, controversial about this sort of mechanism, right? We would say, and I'll prove to you, that under our model, the only reason why the UN works in, under status quo in helping these countries is because there's a taboo, right, Mr. Speaker. There's a moral hazard in terms of uh, how you should grow and environmental growth. And I'll evaluate whether or not China is a prospective uh, uh, ally under our model or their model, right? And then we say, we come to this idea in a POI, they say, if they, if, if they accept under status quo, right, Mr. Speaker, then what's the reason for it? We've already shown you that they haven't given you any benefits that are derived from their model. But even if there were benefits, you still get them under our model as well, right? You then come to this idea of NGOs and how NGOs are like Buzz Lightyear and Superman, and they'll feed everyone in the world, right? Let's let's analyze this. We say in a moral versus pragmatism, <coughs> in a moral versus pragmatism rebuttal, you'll evaluate with three things. The, the actors involved, right, Mr. Speaker? They expect NGOs like Coca-Cola or whatever NGO they'd like to use through the United Nations, right, to fund money to wall most of Africa, most of the Middle East, most of Europe, uh, we think that's an impractical policy, right, Mr. Speaker, because it doesn't serve to doing this. But even if it were to serve to doing this, we would say that no NGO in the world has the capacity to fund Africa in its entirety, to fund the Middle East in, it, in, it, in its entirety, to fund North and South America in its entirety, Mr. Speaker. We would say, in that regard, their policy is quite impractical anyway. And we would say that under status quo, what you have in terms of reconstruction of my first speaker's speech is that you have you, we prioritize political and economical growth, right? Which inevitably leads to things like environmental growth. We would say to use America as, an, as our example, right, Mr. Speaker, they prioritize political and economical growth. That is how they came about these recycled programs, Mr. Speaker. We would say that under our model, once you prioritize these two things, you will forever, you will inevitably get this reward in terms of environmental growth. So most of their substantive matter doesn't stand in today's debate. So proposition doesn't exist. Let's move on to my points of substance and let's analyze what we want to bring to you in today's debate, right? We'll analyze two things specifically in my speech, right, Mr. Speaker? And I'll analyze first how such a program will harm individuals within a country, specifically developing countries, right, Mr. Speaker? And why the power of taboo under status quo is actually a good mechanism to actually do, do this, right, Mr. Speaker? I'll take a PR at any moment now. Right, let's start with this taboo thing. Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's clear something up about the models. In the off-world, countries are currently taking, the countries you talk about hating the UN are currently taking UN aid, US aid, and aid from other developed countries. Well, piece of and have other recycling programs. Piece of not, not <laughs> okay, so we have two scenarios that come out of Proposition's argument, right? My first speaker's eloquent speech was based on the rhetoric that we're seeing in Africa, right? We do not want Western ideologies. We want African problems for African solutions. But beyond that, they come up with a fallacy and say that the Middle East, right, Mr. Speaker, will oblige with us. They tell you that Iraq and Iran will buy into their model. We don't think their model will exist in that regard, right, Mr. Speaker, in helping developing countries aim with environmental hopes, right? We would say that under our model, the power of taboo is the best mechanism to use to bring together these sort of countries to help them in terms of environmental growth, right, Mr. Speaker, to help them in that regard. Let's go on to my speech, right, and, and actually get into this um, matter of the taboo thing, right? Let's run a counterintuitive model under side proposition. Now, the biggest argument that came from side proposition was this entire argument of China, right? We would say that, let's assume they were right and their uh, fallacious policy was actually implemented. Why would Ch which model would China buy into? Current status quo or their model, right? The reason why China, under their model and under their perception, is reducing things like in in environmental harm, it's because it doesn't feel like it's being forced to by anyone else. We've seen that when, we, when you block off China into a corner, it backlashes at you, right, Mr. Speaker? We would say when you force China to do something, it doesn't really do it, right? And in that, in that regard, that means the mechanism that you're using, the United Nations, because of veto action that China can take up, won't work because you're bringing China into, into a sort of an angry mode, right, Mr. Speaker? We don't need to bite us to, to let a snake bite us to know that it's dangerous, Mr. Speaker. No, ma'am, please sit down, right? We think that under our model, the power of taboo, right? The power of other countries telling you that, no, listen, this is bad. And that's why China doesn't necessarily feel that it's being directly and ob uh, obligated to do something, right, Mr. Speaker? We would say that is that is the essential reason why China is reducing the, any harms, right? We would say that's why China wouldn't block any types of environmental.
environmental progressivism within developing countries and themselves. So they need to prove to us why China is more likely to do this, right, Mr. Speaker. So you can already see that under the power of taboo, this is a great mechanism to help countries to, uh, to, uh, to like indirectly uh, guide countries into stopping environmental hazards uh, sort of things, right, Mr. Speaker. But beyond that, we would say that under our model, the only countries that are under status quo, the only countries that can do this, right, is the countries that are politically and economically stable, specifically in countries like Africa, to actually do this, right, Mr. Speaker. Under their model, countries that aren't economically and politically stable will be forced to do this. Imagine what this will do to countries like Somalia, Mr. Speaker, in Africa. This will further deter political and economical growth within these these nations, right, Mr. Speaker, and we don't think that's okay. But beyond that, they need to prove to us that there will be a significant consequence, or else any sort of argument they bring in today's debate will fall on our side. You know why, Mr. Speaker? Because they're arguing for status quo. We would say if proposition want to show up in today's debate, they need to show us that there isn't explicit harms to the individual, to the man on the ground who prioritizes food and economic pros progressivism within his country and, and, their, and their model, right? Because with us, you get everything, Mr. Speaker. You get the environment, you get public growth and you get economical growth. Therefore, side position wins this debate. Wait, eight thirty four? Uh, we thank the gentleman for his speech and we'd like to call up the first speaker of Team Proposition. Throughout this debate, we have heard a very basic misunderstanding of what the status quo actually is coming from side opposition. We have heard a few different conflicting things. Firstly, the environment currently in its state, because we actually need reforms to help improve the environment, is a big problem. And then we've also heard that in the status quo, uh, quo, there is recycling everywhere. And then we also heard that in the status quo, countries can't focus on recycling because they don't have the resources to do this. We see a lot of contradictions coming out of side opposition. And on the side proposition, we're here to clear things up and explain to you exactly how our model is going to be beneficial to society as a whole. In my speech, I will be starting with reputation of opposition's case, and then I will be moving on to the two major clash points of this debate. First, will our, will our model on the proposition actually work? And secondly, why must the environment and a recycling mandate be a priority within society? Now to move on to reputation. Firstly, we have received no response to our point about how this is actually incredibly beneficial to, our, uh, to the environment. In our first substantive speech, we heard an entire, in, excuse me, the proposition's first substantive speech, we heard an entire analysis of the problems of leaving the status quo, of continuing to litter, of not mandating any recycling programs in developing countries. To this, we heard no response other than, you know, maybe in a few countries like China and a few countries in Africa, this won't work. That is all we heard. There was no real response to our substantive debate. Secondly, they said, um, you know, there, where are the benefits going to come from? We've explained this repeatedly. It'll come from NGOs from the United Nations, and additionally, this will come from the international uh, corporations that will step into this. Coca-Cola already sponsors a buyback program. What yeah. we need to do is spread this buyback program to the developing world, so that developing world can have multiple outlets in which to get aid for this problem. Secondly, their entire argument is really based around the fact that in a few different countries there's a stigma, so this won't work. First, I will be addressing this in my, in my major uh, speech about the clash points. But secondly, they've given us a few examples of maybe in these countries they won't want to accept aid, which firstly makes no sense because aid is always a beneficial thing, especially when you're doing this on a principle where people can actually learn to be self-sufficient and you're implementing something that's not just going to disappear. It's not just saying, here's 10 bucks, have fun with it while it lasts. What we're doing is saying, here's a resource, you can use this repeatedly for the, as long as this can last. Secondly, even if we say, sure, you know what, maybe China won't want to accept this program. They're ignoring the fact that this is beneficial to the rest of the developing world. The developing world isn't located in China and a few countries in Africa. The developing world is everywhere. The whole concept of a developing world is the fact that this is a global thing that's happening currently. There's, there are developing countries in the Middle East, in South America, in Central uh, America, in Asia. They are everywhere. And what we're proposing to do is help all of these countries, even if for some weird reason that the proposition cannot understand that the opposition has not clearly justified even if some countries don't accept this, the rest of the world will be having a beneficial impact from this proposition team. 
Secondly, uh, they just say that like, uh, flat out, why would NGOs be donating money to do this? Here's our answer. That's what they were created for. That's what NGOs inherently do. That is their purpose, so they will be donating money to this. Then furthermore, they said political growth must be prioritized. But we say, this. in what way is this mutually exclusive? Why is political growth uh, going to be stopped by, by helping out the environment? This makes no sense. Yes? We tell you because you didn't give us any consequence, then this doesn't become a mandate. Right? Thank you. Here's what the consequence is. They ignored our entire first point about the environment, about how horribly things are going, about the fact that the Maldives, pretty soon if nothing changes, are going to be underwater. The fact that the trash dryer exists because there is so much waste. The fact that this is impacting the ocean, impacting air pollution, and everything else that we brought up in our, in our second substantive point about, excuse me, in our first substantive point about the environment. If we don't change the status quo, then everything is going to continue to worsen. And global warming has been internationally uh, acknowledged to be an unbelievably threatening problem to human and animal and environmental life. So moving on, again, they, then in their last substantive point, the opposition team claimed that this will harm people. How exactly will a program in which we are offering aid to people for cleaning up the world, how is that harmful? We see no real way that this is possible at all. They have, shown, they have managed to succeed in showing no bad things in our plan. And what are they going to do? They have proposed nothing, which means that they support the status quo in which the environment is continually getting worse and worse because we are not addressing these problems. Now to move on to the clash points. Will this actually work? No, thank you. The opposition team tries to invalidate our entire case by saying, you know, as I said, a couple of countries won't accept this aid. And their reasoning behind this is because the countries don't like the Western world. So here are a few responses to this. Firstly, as we brought up the trash dryer, which, by the way, is not a recycling program. That is something to point out. The trash dryer is an accumulation of trash, which is coming from plastic and other waste that is accumulating in the ocean. And it's basically like a trash vortex. It's destroying the ecosystems around it, and it's destroying the ocean. And what's currently happening is African countries, who apparently hate aid from the Western world, are accepting aid in order to help clean this up. The fishermen that are going out and cleaning up this trash, they are getting a monetary compensation for this. So why would this principle not apply to cleaning up recycling? We've heard no real analysis about that. So here is why this is going to work, even if a few countries, maybe they'll say no, for some reason we don't understand. The proposition is bringing you better infrastructure by cleaning up streets in places like India, where trash is getting in the way of transportation, and where trash is getting in the way of building new buildings. This is a basic problem, and if we allow uh, pollution and no more recycling of trash to continue, then this problem is just going to continually worsen. We need to fix this so that, uh, com uh, so that countries can continue to successfully develop. Furthermore, uh, we are giving people a basic way to earn money. As our second speaker stated, her grandmother, as a child, would go around and collect trash and get money from this to help feed her family. This is a principle that we are spreading across the world. There is no way that they can prove that a principle such as this, where we are letting people help feed and take care of their families, how this is bad. We are giving people a way to continue to make money in countries in the developing world where people make on average less than $1 a day. Four cents for a, a bottle that they recycle, that makes a big difference. That's 4% of their normal daily income. What we are doing is we are making a radical change in these people's lives, even if it's through what seems to be a small sum of money. Furthermore, uh, we are giving people a steadier income. This is crucial to a developing world. Stability can happen when people aren't hungry, when people aren't fighting over basic resources. And countries can, as I said, stabilize through these initiatives. Now, secondly, I'm going to move on to the main clash point of this debate. Why must the environment be a priority? The, op the opposition claims it shouldn't be because there are other problems to deal with. Yes, we agree there are other problems. In yeah. what way is this mutually exclusive? Why can't we address hunger and the environment at the same time? As we've proven to you, they actually can go hand in hand under our hand. Um, we received no credible reason as to why our plan is a bad thing. Here's why, as we explained, this must be prioritized. We need to help fix the ocean, fix the ecosystems, fix horrible air pollution that's coming out of these factories that produce plastic waste. By recycling, by mandating recycling programs in different countries, what we're doing is we're reducing this waste. We're helping the animals. And through this, even if for some reason they're not, they don't think that animal rights are a great thing, which they are, through this, if we're helping the animals, we're also helping people. Because people need animals and need a functioning ecosystem in order to survive. Without the environment, where are we going to go? The moon? So far, this hasn't exactly been a very viable source. 
Uh, furthermore, the repercussions of ignoring these problems is that trash will continue to accumulate. The trash giant will get huge. Who knows how much of the ocean this could take over in 150 years if things continually get worse and production increases with nothing to regulate it. Who knows what's going to happen, other than the fact that it will be inherently bad as it will destroy the environment. You must, stand, you must propose this case because we will be helping out the environment at large, we will be helping out the economy of developing countries, and are proposing a mutually beneficial worldwide program. Thank you. Uh, we thank the lady for her speech and would like to call up the first speaker of team opposition. We love the environment, but what we're saying is developing nations should have the ability to prioritize economic development, ladies and gentlemen. And when they get to a stable position, ladies and gentlemen, then we can focus on the environment. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what the proposition had to do in today's debate is take a hard line stance and say, we're going to force governments to prioritize yeah. this. Now, instead, what they did was they took a shaky, soft line and said, we're going to keep status quo as it is, ladies and gentlemen, but we're just going to make it through the UN. What they now stated was, we want NGOs to go into third world countries and subsidize this. Well, we see that's currently what's happening, ladies and gentlemen. NGOs okay. are the ones that are doing this. They should have shown us why governments should be the ones to implement this. And now, I'll be dealing with the rest of their speech in my, in my mm, mm, positive, in my rebuttals. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, let's look at the dumb man. I'll be dealing with, first of all, their policy, ladies and gentlemen, and showing them why their policy isn't really a policy at all, ladies and gentlemen, and why on that premise alone, they fail to fulfill their basic mandate as proposition in a policy debate. And then I'll be analyzing their whole substance, positive matter. All right, let's deal with their policy. Now, the first problem we had with their policy was who would be implementing this and who would be the mechanism of this policy to sit down now. They said, well, NGOs would cooperate with governments and they'd cooperate through the UN, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we showed you that the first fundamental problem we have is through the UN, there's China, ladies and gentlemen, and China has the veto power. And with the veto power, China can stop any, any endeavors of the UN. All right? And we showed you China with the Kyoto Protocol, where they don't want to change their position from a third world country to a first world country because they know they they will be taxed on their carbon emission, ladies and gentlemen. And we showed you examples like this. Their response to this, they didn't really respond to this. They said, okay, so what? a couple of countries won't be really be interested, ladies and gentlemen, in this. We don't mind. But we do mind when that country that isn't interested in this has the ability to stop this whole program at its best. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, we feel their policy should have addressed why governments should do this. We feel their policy should have mandated, ladies and gentlemen, and the word mandated means force, ladies and gentlemen, not nudge, not sing us a sad song in Kumbaya, ladies and gentlemen, and hopefully you'll change your perspective, ladies and gentlemen. We feel sit down now. They should have said, government, you're going to force, we're going to do this, and if you don't do this, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to impose sanctions or whatever the repercussions will be. We feel that's where they feel to fulfill their basic mandate. So their policy doesn't really stand. But then, ladies and gentlemen, their response to this was, look, it's, this isn't really about policies. We don't really have to discuss policies. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the word this house would implies there's a policy. And if your policy is ineffective, like you've claimed it is, but it's not really important, ladies and gentlemen, we feel you fail to fulfill your basic job. And we feel that, ladies and gentlemen, the United States should come to this debate. And hopefully they can do that in their reply. Yes, ma'am, could you? We've told you guys time and time again that the reason that China won't veto is because one, the reasons they say they will aren't in our policy. They talk about carbon emissions. We've told you we're just creating a new infrastructure to recycle. And then second, uh, the second, the is important to them. They don't respond to these arguments. Ma'am, we've shown you with the example of the Kyoto Protocol that China wants to prioritize its economic development over all others, ladies and gentlemen. And if having to sit down and if having to enforce its manpower into building recycling plants and moving it away from another sector, ladies and gentlemen, harms its economy. We showed you that this won't really happen. So we really don't think that's an adequate response. Try again next time. 
right. So, ladies and gentlemen, they came up with one basic point. Mandating recycling programs in developing world is good for the environment. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, we need to ask ourselves, is this the fair or right way to do this? Now, the proposition have done a brilliant job of coming up here and making third world countries seem like they're the, they're all the spawn of evil, ladies and gentlemen, and they're all, they're the reason for pollution. Well, we think, ladies and gentlemen, they need to look at, at this at Luxor's at home, ladies and gentlemen. We see that first world countries contribute way more in terms of waste, ladies and gentlemen, than the developing world. And we think that if they're going to effect change the dynamic for the environment, ladies and gentlemen, they need to implement, they need to stand with propositions, opposition stance, and say, look, we want you, America, ladies and gentlemen, to help, to to start recycling more, ladies and gentlemen, because we see that statistics prove that one American child, ladies and gentlemen, contributes as much waste as 36 African children, ladies and gentlemen. We think fixing this problem is what we need to do, ladies and gentlemen. We don't think shifting the blame to Africa and the, the rest of the third world is a viable solution. But first of all, ladies and gentlemen, even if this isn't true, they came up here and they told us, no man, even if this wasn't true, they came up here and said, Fine, ladies and gentlemen. But let's look at animal rights. Let's look at all these fun, these lovely things. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we think that this is quite naive on the proposition stance, ladies and gentlemen. We think it's quite naive for them to tell us to prioritize animal rights, ladies and gentlemen, when our people are starving, ladies and gentlemen, when people in third world countries are dying of hunger and they don't have hospitals, ladies and gentlemen. Sit down now. We think in third world countries, instead of building recycling plants, government should be building hospitals, ladies and gentlemen. We think government should be building um, utilities, fed seats, toilets, and all these things, ladies and gentlemen, because we feel these things are more more tangible than recycling, no man. But furthermore, they said, look, fine, that's all, that's okay. But our policy creates jobs, man. We say, fine, even if it did create jobs, how many people benefit from these jobs, ladies and gentlemen? Well, their response to this is, it doesn't really matter, we're creating jobs. Well, our response to this is, with, our, with what we're advocating for, more people benefit, ladies and gentlemen. We think more people benefit from having hospitals and schools in their regions than more people benefit from having a recycling plant. And we think that they really need to address this, ladies and gentlemen, instead of hiding behind the, behind it, hiding behind, um, ladies and gentlemen, the fallacious accusations. But furthermore, then they came up here and said to Saddam that, that, okay, it's all fine, but this improves international relations. Well, we tell you, ladies and gentlemen, international relations, like what? We keep bringing up you the examples of China, ladies and gentlemen. We keep bringing you the examples of why would a country want to engage in international relations and fix in the environment, ladies and gentlemen, when their people are starving. We showed you that this perception it sends to the people is quite harmful, ladies and gentlemen, because it sends the perception that government would rather cater to the needs of the rich West, ladies and gentlemen, and show the West that we like the environment and that we want to prioritize what you want to prioritize instead of prioritizing its own people. We think that this is harmful in society, ladies and gentlemen, sit down, and we think that that's what they should have addressed. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, now that we've dealt with, we've, now that we've shown you that there isn't this consolidated international consensus on recycling, ladies and gentlemen, that that's just an assumption that they needed to prove that the whole world was ready for this and that the whole world was on an equal and level playing field, ladies and gentlemen, we've shown you that Ladies and gentlemen, the first flaw in their argument was they took a soft, soft line stance and advocated for status quo, ladies and gentlemen. And we think that this motion wanted them to advocate for a hard line. And we think for those reasons, they failed to make this debate adequate, ladies and gentlemen. But furthermore, we've shown you that the hierarchy of needs, ladies and gentlemen, that we need to prioritize our people over animals, ladies and gentlemen. And they said animal rights. Well, animal rights, ladies and gentlemen, we think animal rights go so far because we still eat these animals, ladies and gentlemen. We still kill them for our own needs, ladies and gentlemen. So we really see that we prioritize humans over us, over the animals. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, they needed to prove that this would be beneficial for the greater majority, and they didn't really prove this, ladies and gentlemen. They needed to prove that the Africans, that the third world countries were producing the most emissions, ladies and gentlemen, and we've shown you that it's actually the developed nations that produce the most amount of waste, and we feel that they didn't respond to this. They left my whole second and first speaker speech standing, ladies and gentlemen, and hid behind the benefits and said, we really are for the benefits, and we think for these reasons, this motion can do nothing but Oh, thank you.
Uh, we'd like to call up the reply speaker of team opposition. writing it was wow. It was like a mathematical equation. I just couldn't get it right. Because in solving my problem, I needed to know what the problem was. With side propositions model, that problem isn't evident because it caters to everything that we spoke to, right? So we don't necessarily know where they come in today's debate. So we completely agree with side proposition on most of their substantive matter because it actually proves our substantive matter that under status quo, all these benefits are derived from. But let's take a look at what they actually did bring us, right? They gave you status quo versus state, status quo, right? Let's just analyze this. Under their model, they used the United Nations, okay? That's done under status quo. United Nations, like I've already told you in my second speaker's speech, that the United Nations all already tells these countries not to do this, and they do this regardless, okay? So that's not anything new in their matter. Second, they used NGOs. Our response, done under status quo. Coca-Cola goes to African countries and they still don't participate. Done under status quo. So, so far, their entire model is based on our substantive matter in today's debate. They then ran to this thing of the United Nations again and said, well, the United Nations are the perfect body to do this. We showed you no. The United Nations isn't the perfect body to do this. We have too many blocks there. The veto action from China, and we showed you about with the Kyoto Protocol that China won't buy into this. Their own example just turned right against them. Again, falls on our side, status quo. So they then run to this thing and we ask them, well, what's the consequence, right? If you don't have a consequence, then nothing will happen. The third speaker speech just pops up and tells us, well, the consequence will be, we'll tell these countries that there will be some sort of environmental hazard to you. We say, status quo. These environmental hazards are there. These countries know that these environmental hazards are there. Do they participate? No. No substantive matter from side proposition so far. Their model is ineffective, doesn't have a how, why, when, or the effectiveness of their model. They then tell you that, no, it's not our burden to prove you success of our model. We tell you, no, it's a policy debate. You're supposed to prove success of your model. That's essentially why we're the opposition. We're supposed to disprove the success of your model. Again, nothing new from side proposition in that regard. We then tell you, however, on the side opposition, as the more dominant side in today's debate, that, well, if you get political and economical development within countries, you will inevitably get environmental growth. No response from side proposition. Uh, side pro proposition, right? We give you an, an, an example like America, where America prioritized political and economical growth. And what did they get? These recycling programs that they wanted. We say their own example falls flat on themselves. We then have a significant problem with their model that they brought up in today's debate again. They say NGOs will do this, right? Two things. One, we asked. Is in, are NGOs going to give money to governments, or will NGOs just go into governments themselves, I mean countries themselves, and do as they please? We tell you one, that won't happen because of sovereignty. We give you an example of China, and tell you that, that China will just won't buy into this idea. No response from side proposition. We tell you second, perception specifically with African countries, and uh, per, uh, specific, specifically with African countries and the Middle East, is that we don't want Western ideologies. We don't want Western help. We don't want Western aid. We give an example like Zimbabwe from my first speaker's speech. Again, no response. So this debate was quite funny, because I felt like side opposition was having a friendly with itself. No substantive matter from side proposition, only substantive matter from side opposition. And even the substantive matter that came from their side falls on our side. And then we ask this question of impracticality, right? We tell you that if you're going to make it mandatory, are you making it forcefully for NGOs to give money to everyone in the world? We tell you, no, this won't happen in Europe because most of the countries are poor, Africa and the Middle East. No response in today's debate. We evidently win.
Okay, we'd like to call up the reply speaker of team proposition to conclude this debate. <laughs> Thank you. 